Turn to page 435. 435 says, Jesus came into my heart. 435. <laughs>
first we beg stand as we go to the throne of grace. Our loving Father, we're grateful today for this opportunity again to pause from the busyness of life. And as the psalmist said, be still and know that I am God. And Lord, as we are still, we also realize that great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And we give thanks, forgive us for our ingratitude of health and strength and the abundance that is in our lives. We take for granted and often we, we do not pause to say thank you Lord Jesus. Now Father as we come this Lord's Day we realize one of the great importance of our country and of us is the election coming Tuesday. Amen. We're reminded that righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach of any people. Lord, we pray for your divine guidance in your hand. That's right. I pray Christians will vote for righteous. I pray that Christians will vote for life. I pray that Christians will vote for liberty. Amen. And I pray, Father, that your hand might be upon this election and this time. Amen. Yet however the outcome might be, good or bad, our hope is in the Lord. Amen. Not in the politicians. Right. And God is still on the throne and we're still going to rejoice in the Lord always. So I pray, Father, that you would give us hearts of oneness and bind us together with your love. And may your will be done. In Christ Jesus, I pray, amen and amen. God bless you. May you be seated. All right. I want all the children to come down front. All of the children to come down front. <laughs> Right here, right, right here, right here. What would you do with Right here. Candy? All you kids, come sit on the floor, right here on the chair. Right here. More down now. Don't be don't be bashful. Somebody can sit up here by the preacher. I don't bite and I don't stink. <laughs> uh, sit up here by me. There you go. Why oh. you know, don't you come over and sit by me, buddy? Come over here and sit by me. This is my buddy Gideon. Here, right here, honey. Right here. Right here. I want you to sit by me. You're going to be my helper. You be my helper? Okay. You be my helper. Do you know what this is? What is it? It's Play-Doh. Let's see what we got in here. I'll get this Play-Doh out here. I'm more nervous talking to these kids than I am the adults. I'm tell you what. <laughs> My hands are shaking it's because they are shaking. This is Play-Doh. What do you do with Play-Doh? Huh? You do what? You play. And do you... What else do you do with it? Do you, do you make stuff out of it? Well, sure you do. Sure you do. You've got Play-Doh and you make stuff out of it. Well, you know, Play-Doh is kind of like what God is... What? Okay. Well, this Play-Doh is kind of like you and I in God's sight. God says that, that we are like He's the potter. Jeremiah says that God is the potter and we are the clay. And God takes the clay in his hands and he, he, he starts to mold that clay in his hands. And that's what God does to you and I. We're the clay and God is the potter. And, and sometimes the, the potter will make something and he says, you know, I don't quite like the way that looks. I'm going to do it again. And he starts making something else. Now let me tell you something. First of all, 
My artistic ability is exactly zero. 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 I can't even make stick people that you used to do in grade school and make them look like stick people. But here the potter, he's making something. He's, he's taking this clay and he's molding it in his hands. And that's what God does to you and I. And you know what God did? God took this clay and he began to mold it. He says, you know what I'm going to do with that clay? I'm going to do something very special with that clay. I'm going to, let me see it again. I'm not very good at this. Can you do that? Can you roll it? You roll it for me, Gideon. You do it. I believe you. I believe you can do it better than I can. There you go, buddy. There you go. Oh, he's my helper. I tell you what. I've also got a knothead grand, uh, great grandson sitting here. He's knothead number three. I've got two grandsons, knothead number one and knothead number two. But this is my great grandson. He's not head number three. No, you're not number four. You're number three. I've only got three. You got that done, buddy? Well, let me see it. You know what God did? God took that clay and He said, I'm going to do something really special to show how much I love you. What is that? It's a cross. It's the cross. And God said, You know what? I'm going to send. My only son, I molded him and made him so special. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send him and he's going to give his life on the cross of Calvary. And, and our lives are just like Play-Doh. God molds them and God designs them. Now let me ask you this question. What happens if you just leave that Play-Doh laying out on the table? What happens? Okay. Right. It dries up. That's exactly right. And if we're not careful, we can let our lives dry up and not be really of any value. As long as this Play-Doh is, is pliable and so forth, it, it's, it's valuable. But if it dries up, then it doesn't have much value. And so here's, here's the message, the sermon from Play-Doh. Our lives just like Play-Doh. God knows them. He call, he, God says he's the potter and we're the clay and God knows them. And, and listen, God makes different things out of the clay. Every, every piece of clay is not the same. And what God makes special in your life is not what he may do to somebody else. But we need to make sure that we let God mold us. We're the clay. God is the potter. He's going to mold us. And God protects us. That's exactly right. All right. So I want you to remember now, we've got something very special for every one of you this morning. Now, here's the thing. You can't have anything that's in this bag till after church. <laughs> First of all, there's, there's a bag. It's got, it's got your own Play-Doh in it. It's got a spinner in it. It's got uh, it's got all kinds of stuff. I don't know what it is. This jewel knows more about it than I do. It's got a it's got a sleeky it's got a sleeky whatever whatever it is. It's got it's got all kinds of little things. Now that that's that's your bag. Then wow, that what's in that bag? Get in. Tell me what's in the bottom of that bag. Candy. <laughs> Bag full of candy. Just this is Holy Ween rather than Halloween. Last night was Halloween. We're celebrating Holy Ween. Amen. And because, huh? You you want a bag? <laughs> it's got a spinner and all that in it. This jewel, you got. It. I want this jewel. Well, here. There's a fidget spinner in every bag. There's a fidget spinner in every, every bag. bag. Right, you can, <laughs> here, I'm going to let you have the blue ones. Here, no, no, you got to keep it. No, you got to keep it in your bag for now. But here's your bag. Here, that's your bag. 
Sissy, you would agree with? Yeah. Huh? Is that, is that, is that your color? I got purple. Or purple? I'm going to give Gideon the green one. I'm going to give him the green one. And let's see. He's a pretty one for Esther there. He's a pretty one. Now, purple for Miss Esther. There's Miss Esther. Okay. And there's a glow in the dark green one there for... Actually, it's the black ones that glow in the dark. Oh, it's the black ones that glow in the dark. Who else needs a bag? Oh, 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 baby, baby. <laughs> Now, we've got a couple of our kids that wasn't here last time. Oh, thank you so much. This is, this is my great-granddaughter, Gracie. She is a little pill. That's fine. That's fine. Did everybody get a bag now? And let's see. I know the Malishkin boys aren't here this morning. We've got two bags for, for them. They're not here. We've got two bags for them, and two of our little girls aren't here. They're in Iowa this morning, but we gave them bags last Sunday. Uh, Clara and Eva, we gave Eva, we gave them bags last Sunday. So we've got some extra. If you've got somebody special that you want to give a bag to, it's all full of, of goodies. Uh, now, don't blame me for their sugar high. <laughs> I'm just the grandpa. <laughs> Don't blame me. So, uh, they, they've got enough stuff in there to last up the rest of this week and probably. Uh, yeah. but, but listen now, you can't, you can't eat your stuff and so forth until after church, and you've got to let mom and daddy have your bag. All right, you can go back to your seats. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, buddy. By, by, by the way, Gideon, mother's birthday today, Miss Rebecca. She's, they, have, they have five children, and uh, Joshua and Miss Rebecca, and today's her birthday. All right, Brother Terry. All right, let's go with uh, let me read my spot here. Let's go with number one hundred. Number one hundred ninety-five. Thank you. Yeah, the Lord is your name. <laughs>
Operation Christmas Child. I think they're close to 300 there now. Uh, last week, I think there was 295, but anyway, close to 300. And uh, now, you realize when they ship these, there's a cost of shipping. You've ever gone to the post office to ship a box or UPS, there's a cost of shipping. It costs approximately $9 a box to ship those boxes. Now, we'll take them to a drop-off station, and they will pack them in containers and ship them. <coughs> but there is a shipping cost. And that cost is around $9 a box. And so we're asking those of you who would and could to, to help with the shipping cost of that to the Samaritan Purse. And if you just designate that in your offering to the church uh, for shoebox, for shipping, and we will send a check along with these boxes to Samaritan Purse to help cover the shipping. So, uh, and, and uh, again, uh, there's filler boxes or extra boxes that, and stuff out also in the vestibule there. So let's do that. Don't forget Wednesday night uh, at 6.30, our Bible study, Brother Cullen Burke is, is going to be doing the, the month of November. He's done a lesson from Haggai that is absolutely phenomenal. If I was a professor grading him, I would grade him an A plus on his his study, an A plus on his presentation, and an A plus on his enthusiasm. He has done fabulous, and I am so proud and so grateful to have Cullen here as our intern associate. And uh, he's going to be taking on more and more responsibility as the new year comes along also. So Wednesday night, we're going to have a harvest potluck party on the 13th at 6 p.m. And bring in casserole soup and plus a dessert and salad. Uh, we're underway with our new food bank expansion. We're putting an addition of about 500 square feet that's going to be a primarily as a storage area so when food is available we can get that food and we'll have a place to store it. We were able to get a grant from the Well Food Bank and uh, that is paying for this addition. Now we didn't include the electrical work that needed to be done. Mike said, preacher, what do we do about the electrical? He said, I've got an electrician I can call, and he called Joe the electrician, sitting right here this morning. Amen. He walked into my office with a Trump hat on, and I said, you've already got my vote. <laughs> now, now, now you want my pocketbook. <laughs> God sent this man, so good to have him and his wife Sherry with us this morning. And what a blessing. So I, I, I sent pictures to Will and he said, you know, we're well underway, and an invoice from Mike for part of his work. And I said, I've got an electrician working now, and that's not included in the in the in the Mike's bid. I said, Will that be covered? And they wrote me back and said, Yes, that'll be covered. So again, God just keeps pouring down the blessings. I don't understand it, but God just keeps opening the windows of heaven. And so this is quite a long. They've got all framed in out there. And uh, they'll have insulation in the roof and all that put on it this coming week. And the weather, of course, is going to be tremendous. But uh, that's great. But now the Lotus are our missionaries of the month to Nigeria. Shea, Abigail, Barnabas, and Christabel. Right now, Nigeria is probably the most dangerous country for a Christian in the world. Literally this last week, again, Christians were killed simply because they were Christians. And this precious couple, who are originally from Nigeria, went back to Nigeria to their people, knowing how dangerous it is. And I hope we'll certainly remember them in our prayers Amen. in Nigeria. All right, I believe that's all of our announcements. Don't forget again, Food Bank will be this coming Saturday. And uh, those who would like to help and volunteer, uh, 8.30, 
we, we run our food bank from 9 till 11. So those who would like to come and volunteer and help, you can hear about April 30 again. I can't tell how faithful I am for all of our food bank workers. Now, we're about to lose. Ms. Linda and Brother Paul are getting ready to go back to Arizona this coming week. So we're going to lose them for six months. And so that's a, that's a big hole in our work. Amen. Those, those two just uh, do tremendous, tremendous. So we're going to miss them. We're so thankful. By the way, they just celebrated their 40th wedding anniversary in October. I, I, I married them 40 years ago. <laughs> Many people you get to marry and have been around 40 years and you're still around. <laughs> then Paul just had a birthday on Friday. So uh, he, he's uh, him, him and Ms. Linda. They're precious, precious to us. All right, let's have another song, Brother Terry. Page 149, page 149, because he lived. <laughs>
song was written by Bill Gaither. Bill and I was pastoring Grace Baptist Church in Brookfield, Missouri. A wonderful little church, a little country town in northern Missouri. Back then, Jerry Falwell had the old time gospel hour program on television. And it, it, he was on, on Sunday nights, I don't know, 9.30 or 10 o'clock. We could listen to good gospel music and so forth. You ever remember the old, when, the old time gospel hour? Jerry Falwell had a singer. His name was Dunn Odom. Mm -hmm. Dunn was probably as big as this pulpit here. <laughs> he grew up a big, big, big brother. But he had seen the king is coming, and I mean, it was just absolutely phenomenal. And I believe with all of my heart and soul the king is coming. Amen. I believe the king is on the throne. Here we go. Amen. What happens on Tuesday? The king is on the throne and the king is coming. Amen. Amen. In 1961, when John F. Kennedy had won the presidency of the United States, he had invited Billy Graham to come and play a round of golf with him. And Billy Graham had played a round of golf with John F. Kennedy, who, again, was a devout Catholic. And they were riding in the golf cart, and John F. Kennedy looked to Billy Graham and says, Billy, do you believe that Jesus is coming again? And Billy Graham looked at John F. Kennedy and said, I believe with all of my heart. That's what the Bible teaches. I believe it. And John F. Kennedy said to Billy Graham, why don't we hear about it then? That's a great question. Why don't we hear about the second coming? I, I, I can't speak for anybody else, but if you've ever been around here very long, you'll hear me speak about it quite frequently. Because I believe it. I'm doing a series titled Glad You Asked, questions that people have. We talked about, you know, what do, you, do, do we believe the Bible is the inspired word of God? Absolutely. What do we believe about creation? What do we believe about marriage between a man and a woman? What, what, what is, how does the Old Testament apply to us today? Last week I spoke about are we living in the last days? And yes, we are living in the last days. The last days began with the ascension of Christ into heaven after his death. And the last days will accumulate with Christ coming back in the air. When we talk about prophecy and the schedule or the calendar, what is the next thing on God's calendar? A prophecy. And the next thing, the schedule, is the second coming of Christ. Matthew chapter 24, we looked at it last week, and Jesus talked about how that, that again, we want the things we could look for in the last days about his coming. And when we talk about the second coming of Christ, let me be abundantly clear and emphatic that no one knows the day, the time, nor the hour, not even the angels in heaven. Yep. So for someone to set dates or say certain things, that is a false prophet. <clears throat> we do not know when Jesus is coming, but we are admonished to be prepared for that coming. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And stand with me as I read this morning. I read from the New King James. And I'm beginning in verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Paul is writing to the Christians, the believers, at Thessalonica. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, 
concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for letting us have this time to be seated in heavenly places in Christ our Lord. We rejoice in the truth that the King is coming. And I pray that you would help us to be steadfast and unmovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as we know that our labor is not in vain. Bless the opening of your word. May it be manna from heaven to our soul, and may the spirit of the living God fall afresh upon us and stir our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. God bless you. Be seated. This scripture passage that I just read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 gives us one of the clearest teachings on the subject of what we call the second coming of Christ, also referred to as the rapture of the church. But remember, it was Jesus himself who gave us a very important and particular emphatic message that he would come again. One of the great chapters of the Gospel of John is the 14th chapter. In the 13th chapter, Jesus had shared with his disciples at the Last Supper how that he soon would be going away and how he soon would be dying upon the cross of Calvary. He had shared with the disciples, he saw their hearts were heavy and downcast in the news that he had shared to them that one of them would betray him and one of them would, 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 would put the kiss of death upon him. And in that 13th chapter, Jesus had shared it. He saw the heart of his, those he loved that was heavy and sad. And you come to the 14th chapter of John's Gospel, and Jesus said, Hey, listen! Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house there are many mansions. If we're not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. Amen. John chapter 14, verse 3. Amen. Jesus said, I will come again. Amen. That's the words of our Lord. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus had told the disciples, listen, you wait here and Jerry here because the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the other ends of the earth. Then the disciples were standing there on the Mount of Olives. And all of a sudden, Jesus, who had been after his resurrection 40 days upon the earth, there upon the Mount of Olives, Jesus ascends into glory. In Acts chapter 1, verse 11, there's two men whom I believe are certainly angels. You see these two men, they were at the tomb when Mary and Martha came, when the women came over to that first Easter. And they're standing on the, the Mount of Olives as Jesus ascends bodily. The disciples are standing there. They see him ascending, going up. And there's two angels, two, two, two men, they're called men, they're angels. 
in Acts chapter 1 and verse 11. And those two angels said to those disciples, Hey, had he told you that he was going to be going? And then these two angels in verse 11 of Acts chapter 1 said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Now think about that. How did Jesus ascend into heaven? He ascended bodily. It was not a ghost. He ascended bodily into heaven. And so the angel said to those disciples standing there on the mouth of olives, see this event? Listen, don't be discouraged. Don't be dismayed. Don't be so sad. This see Jesus that you have seen ascend into heaven is going to come back in like manner. Amen. Amen. He, he Amen. ascended bodily. He's coming back bodily. Now, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, in this scripture passage before us, we read the account of how the king is coming. The king could come in 2020. We do not know the day, nor do we know the hour. But the fact is, the king is coming. I love the story of the young lady who was asked for a very asked out for a very special date. And so she took the day off of work. She went to the beauty shop and had her fingernails all done and her hair all done. She she found the best dress that she had. She, she was ready for the date to come. An hour, the date had not showed up. <coughs> Two hours, the date had not showed up. She said, well, I've been stood up, I guess. So she took her beautiful dress off, put her pajamas on, took her hair down, got her junk food out, and let her dog <laughs> sit in her lap. <laughs> Watching as the world turns. <laughs> and there's a knock on the door. And it was her date. He said, you're not ready yet. I gave you two extra hours to get ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Lord's given you and I plenty of time to get ready. And Amen. Jesus is coming again. Let me make just two, couple, two preliminary uh, comments before we dig into this passage. First of all, Paul is writing to this church at Thessalonica. And he, he, his, his, his purpose of writing is pastoral. Paul was an evangelist, but he was a pastor at heart. And the church of Thessalonica was troubled and so forth. They thought that the, if, when people died, then they weren't going to be taken up in the second coming. And so Paul is writing, and, and this, this passage is a pastoral passage. His, his intent is to again give comfort. And second, when we talk about the second coming of Christ, uh, this can get confusing, but we, we have several terms that we use as Bible believers. We believe that the second coming is literal, it's personal, it is imminent, it's pre-tribulational, and it's pre-millennial when Christ will come. Now that's a mouthful, I understand that. Mm -hmm. But that statement comes directly from our articles of faith. We believe that the coming of Christ is literal and therefore not symbolic. Many people believe, well, the coming of Christ, that's just a symbolism. It's not going to be literal. It's not going to be real. We believe that it's literal. That Christ literally will come in the air. Just as the two angels said to the disciples, Why do you stand gazing into heaven? This same Jesus shall come again. Amen. So we believe it's literal, not symbolical. We believe it's imminent, meaning that it can happen at any time. 
There's nothing that needs to transpire that would hinder the second coming of Christ. Now for 2,000 years, Christians have believed that. But let me tell you, the clock of time in the last days is closer to the midnight hour today than it was 2,000 years ago. We also believe that it's pre-tribulational. That Christ is going to come back for his saints before the tribulation where the Antichrist comes upon the earth and is ruling for seven years. And you've got to have the mark of the beast to buy or sell. And we believe it's pre-millennial. We believe that Christ is going to come back before the thousand years millennium that the book of Revelation describes where Christ is going to literally set up his kingdom on earth for one thousand years. And when we talk about the coming of the Lord, I mean, it's literally a series of events. It's not just one event, but it's a series of events. And when we talk about the second coming of Christ, it comes in two phases. Phase one is what we're going to talk about this morning when Christ comes in the air for his saints. Phase two is at the end of the tribulation period, the seven years of Jacob's trouble, when the Antichrist is controlling this earth, and then the battle of Armageddon takes place in the valley of Megiddo. And Christ returns to the earth this time. Where his feet will touch the Mount of Olives. And that will split apart. And Christ will literally set up the, his thousand year reign upon the earth called the Millennial Kingdom. All described in the book of Revelation. Now I've spent a very deal of time before I even get to my main thoughts. So I'm going to have to go fast. You're going to have to listen hurriedly. <laughs> we see five truths from our scripture passage this morning. And let me share them with you very quickly. We see the first truth is, in verse 13, the problem of sorrow. Look at verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, Concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. In verse 13, Paul, who has this pastoral heart of compassion and love, says to these believers in Thessalonica, who were going through immense persecution for their faith. And there's a good chance these next four years, you and I will go through an immense persecution our faith. And we've got to determine where we're going to stand and who we're going to serve. And I'm going to stand with Joshua who says, for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. I don't care what the government says. I don't care what the president says. I don't care what the governor says. For me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen. They can make all the laws they want to. They can sell they want to. They can burn the building down. That's not going to stop me. It's stop uh, from, from serving the Lord and, and, and preaching the gospel. Amen. Amen. If we have to do it out of an empty field somewhere, we'll do it. But Paul had this pastoral concern, the problem of sorrow. So notice in that 13th verse, he says, But I don't want you to be ignorant. Now, he wasn't belittling them in any way, shape, or form. The word ignorant there says, he's simply saying, I want you to understand, dear brothers and sisters. I want you to know. I, I, I want you to be, I want you to comprehend. Here was the problem of sorrow. The problem was that many of their brothers and sisters in Christ had died. <clears throat> they were buried. They thought if Christ was coming back, those who had died well, they don't have any hope because they're in the grave. So, so that's why they were kind of discouraged. And so Paul says, listen, I understand your problem of sorrow. And I, want, I don't want you to be ignorant. I want you to understand. Now, they thought that Jesus would come back at any time. But they, really, they thought, well, those who had, had died. Now, I love this term in verse 13. 
I love the term. Concerning those who what have fallen asleep. That is the terminology of a Christian who has passed and died. When you die in Christ, the Bible calls that fallen asleep. Now what happens? This is what happens. When the Christian dies, the soul, the spirit, goes immediately to be with the Lord. But our temple, our tabernacle, or house, this body, is asleep. It is in the grave where the ashes are scattered or whatever. But Paul refers to this body of a Christian as being asleep. He said, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to not be able to comprehend what has happened to those who have fallen asleep. Those who have died in the Lord. He uses that term in verse 13, in verse 14, and verse 15. Again, describing believers. They have fallen asleep. Now, we do not believe, are you listening? We do not believe in soul sleep. We believe the soul at the moment of death goes into the presence of the Lord. Amen. Amen. But we believe the body, which is the house. Now, I have a lovely house here in Erie that I'm so thankful for. But if Jill and I are in that house, it's just a house. When Jill and I are in that house, it's our home. It's a world of difference. When the spirit, the soul is gone from this body, this is just an empty house, a temple, a tent. It's a house. And the house is buried. The spirit, the soul, is gone to be with the Lord. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 11? Jesus came to the grave of his friend Lazarus. And the sisters of Mary, his sisters Mary and Martha, were so disturbed and caught up with grief. And Jesus said, listen, ladies, your brother's just asleep. He's just asleep. By the word, by the way, that word, that word asleep uh, is, is, is part of where we get the word cemetery from. Greek, the Greek word cemetery. Asleep that will be awakened. Do you remember when Stephen the deacon, who was fervent for the Lord and preached Christ, and they didn't like it, they stoned him in Acts chapter 7. And in verse 59, Stephen cried out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And in verse 60 it says, And Stephen fell asleep. The body died. Paul is concerned for these dear people. Now he's not saying we should not have sorrow. We should not have grief. But our sorrow and grief is real, but it's different. <laughs> you see, when our loved one dies, are you listening? When our loved one dies, it's not goodbye, adios. Right. When our loved one dies, it's good night. Sure. I'll see you in the morning. Wow. Amen. Amen. Now, does that not mean our hearts can weep tears of grief? But they're not tears without hope. Right. Our tears are tears of hope. I will see you in the morning on the other side. And Paul says, listen, don't be me. I don't want you to grieve that you think there's no hope. So we, we see the, pro the problem of sorrow. Secondly, quickly, notice the promise is sure. Verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Amen. 
Now verse 14 is a concise summary of biblical Christianity. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. That's what the gospel is. That's what Christianity is about. That Christ died as a sinless sacrifice for you and I. His blood was pure and his blood washes us as white as snow. That he died, that he was buried, that he was three days and three nights in the grave of Joseph of Arabia. But on the third day, hallelujah, he arose. That's right, amen. And that's the gospel. And that's what verse 14 is all about. Let me tell you, the old rugged cross is still our focal point today. The old rugged cross is still what keeps us on course today. And we may get lost in the maze of confusion that is around us this moment. We may get lost in that maze. Now, I've never been to a maze because, first of all, I don't like being lost. <laughs> and number two, I'm claustrophobic. <laughs> I'll give me the wide open ranges, please. Don't put me in a maze. Amen. But so much of life, we feel like we're in a maze. You know, you go down this, and all of a sudden there's a wall. You go left or right. We don't know what to do. And, and life is so much like that. The old rugged cross stands high to the earth to give us a compass of direction. We'll stay looking at the cross. And that's what he's saying in verse 14. He's saying, God will bring with him those who sleep. Do you see that in verse 14? He's going to, when he comes at the rapture, he's going to bring the spirit, the souls of those who sleep. Their bodies here, their souls there. There's going to be a reunion, bringing them back together. Now, why, why can we have confidence about this? Look at the first part of verse 15. For this be say to you, wow, by the word of the Lord. It gives us a reason to have confidence. The word of the Lord. You see, the second coming of Christ, the rapture, is not some man-made, made-up doctrine. It's not theological speculation. It's sure. Amen. We'll just build all three pillars. The three pillars are the redemption provided by Christ on the cross. The resurrection of Christ from the grave after three days. And the revelation of Christ whose word we have. Quickly notice number three. The participants are certain. The participants are certain. Verse 15. He says that we who are alive and remain... Until the coming of the Lord, will by no means You see, these believers of Thessalonica during that time, persecuted, they thought when their loved ones had died, that was the end for them. So they were filled with sorrow. They were filled with apprehension. And so Paul tells us who's going to participate. And that participation is certain. Paul again refers to those who have fallen asleep and directly, directly uh, addresses that concern. I understand you're concerned about those who are falling asleep, those who died, those who are in the grave. And so he says, listen, when Christ comes in the air, those who have fallen asleep, those who are in the grave, in a casket, in a box, 
for those whose ashes have been scattered. It makes no difference. God knows every molecule of these bodies that were made. Amen. You know, what about our wonderful heroes who died in the ocean when their ships were sunk by the Japanese subs and they're buried in the bottom of the ocean? What about them? God knows where every one of them is just like he knows where I am and you are. I haven't decided what I want to do when I die. <laughs> I have. First of all, I'm not looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for the operator. Amen. Well, I haven't decided. I could be buried at Fort Logan as a veteran. And that's cool with me. I'd rather be buried right here. I don't know. I'm not worried about it. Because when that day happens, and we don't know when that day will happen, I'm going to be kicking gold dust in glory, and y'all get to deal with this old body. Amen. Y'all get to worry about that. I'm all said, put me in a pine box and just, you know, I'm fine. Because I'm, I, I, I'm going higher someday. Amen. He talks about the participants are certain. Paul says these people who have fallen asleep will not be forgotten. They will take precedence over Christians who are still alive. So those who are dead in the grave, ashes scattered, they're going to come out first. They come out of the grave first and the spirit that's been with Jesus now will really unite with that body. <coughs> then, we which are alive should be alive when that comes. The dead are come forth from the grave first, and then we which are alive and remain will be caught up to be the Lord in the air. You see, the participants are certain. And here's the thing. <laughs> when we talk about the sixth coming of Christ, the living have no advantage over the dead. The living have no advantage. Number four, quickly. Well, number four. The plan is set. The plan is set. Verse 16 and 17. We've looked at the problem of sorrow. It's now been solved. The promise is sure. We've talked about he's coming. The, the participants are certain. The plan of the rapture set forth in verses 16 and 7. And Paul lists eight key elements. Look what's going to happen beginning in verse 16. The first is a sudden descent. Verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. A sudden descent. It's the Lord himself. It's, it's, it's not a proxy. It's not an angel. It's not a ghost. It's the Lord himself. Amen. So we see that the 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 the, the sudden descent, and this is literal. Again, Acts one eleven. This same Jesus, as you see going, will come again. Number two, we see a loud command or shout. Verse sixteen: For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, a command. This is a military term. Again, in the military, you know, if you were at ease and standing out, all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the officer comes, Hot to! But if you jump to attention, you stand, you know, you're not slouched over, you know. You're at attention. It's a command! It's a shout. Hot to! Hot! Still hear that ringing in my ears. <laughs> Yes, sir! I do everything quickly, most of the time, except eat. Because they run you through the chow hall like you was running the hogs through the trough. And I determine if I ever get out of this place, I'm going to sit down and enjoy my meal. And I do. It's one of the few things, and I don't hurry, hurry. By the way, I'm talking about a meal. This kid gave me a gift certificate 
for fast food to the Wishbone Restaurant, Chicken Restaurant down in Westminster. I had the most fabulous <laughs> plate of chicken livers that you ever had. Oh my word, were they good! I was sure we'd take half of them home and I ate all of them. <laughs> Too that. Plus, chicken thighs and and, and potatoes and gravy, oh, it was so good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Glory. <laughs> that shout. The Lord is coming. Number three, the Lord said the archangel. Daniel 12 and Jude 9 identifies the archangel as Michael. Then the trump of God, number four. The Bible is filled with references of the trumpet. In Exodus 19, a very loud trumpet was used to call the people to meet with God. And I believe the trumpet of God will sound. That will mean it's time to, the Lord is coming. We're caught to be with Him. Number five is a great resurrection. The dead in Christ will be raised first. That's a statement of priority. But notice also it's just the dead what in Christ are raised. This is only a resurrection of believers. Yep. Unbelievers will not be resurrected till the end of the millennial kingdom 1,000 years after Christ at the great white throne judgment. This resurrection is a resurrection of believers only. Number 6, verse 17, there's going to be a glorious rapture then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. That word caught up is where we get the English word rapture from. And we're going to be caught up to be with them. Those who have died and have already been raised. Then we which are alive are going to be caught up to be with them. Bible describes it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 52 as the twinkling of an eye. Right. I mean, that's how quickly this will transpire. One moment you're driving your car and the next neo, the nanosecond, nanosecond you're flying through the clouds. One second you're eating a burrito and the next second you're <laughs> Number seven, we see it's going to be a grand reunion, verse 17. He says, caught up together with them in the clouds. Amen. Caught up together with them right. in the clouds. Thank <coughs> God, when death comes to the Christian, it's not goodbye. It's good night, sweetheart. I'll see you in the morning. I hate goodbyes. All my life, I've said goodbye to people that I've loved. We never lived close to relatives, so if I went to visit any of my grandparents or anybody, we just, you know, then goodbye. And you don't see them for months and months and months and maybe years sometimes. I hated goodbyes. As a pastor, I've had to say goodbye to a lot of people that I loved in the sense you were leaving them. The war for a Christian is not goodbye, but it's goodbye. But this grand reunion. And lastly, this joyful meeting. This joyful meeting. Notice what he says in verse 17. He says, we to meet the Lord in the air, and thus shall, and, and, thus, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Amen. All that joyful meeting. We shall meet him and see him as he is. Now let me lastly give you the purpose of the rapture. Verse 18. Very simple. Very simple. Verse 18. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. The word comfort literally means encourage. Encourage. When you comfort someone, you are encouraging them. You're, you're, you're lifting them up. And the purpose of the rapture is to comfort, to, to encourage us. 
We're going to lose people that we love dearly. But Jesus is coming again. But the resurrection is born to take place. Amen. That's why Paul said in First Thessalonians, uh, First Corinthians, chapter fifteen and verse fifty-eight, he says, "Therefore, my beloved brethren, being ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain." The purpose of prophecy gives us hope. Comfort and encouragement. And brothers and sisters, Jesus is coming again. Let's stand as we pray. Our Father, we're so thankful today for the hope that is ours in the resurrection, in the coming of our Lord. This has already been a great day of the Lord with the great music to see our children in front of us here this morning. Amen. How grateful we are. Jesus says, suffer the children to come unto me. For such is the kingdom of heaven. Children are trusting. Children are loving. We talked about the rapture, the second coming. We asked the question, is Jesus really going to come again? Or is that just a myth? We know the Bible teaches that Jesus is literally going to come again. But only those who put their faith and trust in him as their Lord and Savior will be caught up in the air. If there's someone this morning who's not taken that step of faith to commit their hearts and lives to Jesus, all the steps of salvation are so simple. For the Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I pray that there's a heart today that's uncertain about their eternal destiny. They might take that step of faith. Even where they're sitting at this very moment or standing, they invite Jesus into their heart. Saying, now I'm a sinner, but I need to be saved to Christ. Come into my heart. May your will be done, Father, as we pause for this moment of invitation. In Christ I pray, amen. And amen. Amen. Page 161, please. 161. Oh, 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 oh. So
It is such a joy this morning to have the Cavender family all here. Miss Jan has worked so tirelessly for this project up here. I am so grateful and appreciative of all that she has done. And it's good to have Lynn and Steve and granddaughter and new husband this morning. Amen. It's so great to have the Cavender family. We love and appreciate them tremendously. Brother Norland, dismiss us in prayer. Greet one another with his love. God bless you. By the way, let's see. I want to make sure that the listeners get their two bags. <laughs> 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 <A> special delivery. <laughs> now, somebody else that wasn't here that's normally here, or, or somebody, we've got one, two, three, four, five, or six bags left. God bless you. Brother Norland, dismiss us. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your goodness to us. We're thankful for our time in your house this morning. We're thankful for our pastor and the message that he had this morning. Amen. Go with us, Lord, this afternoon. We ask for safety as we leave and try to direct our lives for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.